Nonfiction November is in the rearview mirror for most of us. I did read all these books in November, but other videos got in the way. I guess I didn't plan well. <sighs> so I'm just now getting around to talking about them, but better late than never, right? an earlier video where I talked about the four books that I picked up for this year's nonfiction November. Olive at a Book Olive provided us with four words to guide our choices. This is the first nonfiction November I've ever participated in, and I had a lot of fun with it, and I did read all these books in November. I'll have to say I really enjoyed it, and I got lucky because I found a book that was suitable for each prompt in my massive to-be-read pile. So without further ado, I'll tell you what I thought of each one of them. The first book I chose was The Liar's Club by Mary Carr, and I chose that to go with the word fraud. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in what happens in this book. There are surprises throughout, and I don't want to spoil it for you if you haven't read it yet. Mary Carr did not have an easy childhood. Both her parents were alcoholics who came from rough circumstances themselves, but while her dad was upfront and honest about his lies, her mom was a bit more private. This book was first published in 1995. It's amazing to me that I haven't gotten around to reading it until now. I I think I probably had a subconscious desire not to read it because I was afraid it would be too upsetting. Carr grew up on the Gulf Coast of Texas in a small town where the workers on oil rigs housed their families. But despite her parents' difficulties. They weren't intentionally abusive, I don't think. I mean, I don't think they had any problems with their children. I think in their own way, they love them. But as sadly often happens, children suffer more from their parents' problems than anyone guesses at the time. Traumatic things do happen to both the parents and the girls, but Carr often compares her family favorably to the more normal families in their middle-class neighborhood. The worst things that happened to her growing up actually came at the hands of a neighbor and of another adult who wasn't in the family. But she believes that her family were the colorful ones, which somehow made them superior to the boring families around them. She seems to find a kind of defiant triumph in that distinction, although she never says it justifies the insanity that she and her older sister had to endure. I guess you could argue that, at the very least, what she went through while growing up made her the woman that she became. I'm not saying that that's true for all abuses of families, but I think it was the case in cars. I really think love was at the core. I just think the parents didn't have the coping skills or the maturity to handle life as well as they should have. But Mary Carr becoming what she is was in a way a good thing. I mean, she is an absolutely fantastic writer. This is a book that needs to be read and understood, and when I finished it, I felt hollowed out and out of breath the way Mary probably felt when she was a child. Carr went on to write two more memoirs, Cherry and Lit. Both are highly acclaimed. She's also written several books of poetry and a book, The Art of the Memoir, for those who would like to write one of their own. I think I would like to one day go ahead and read Cherry and Lit. I think it would be very interesting to see what happened to her after her childhood. The next book I read in November was Agent Sonia, The Spy Next Door by Ben McIntyre. This was for the word web, and it's the first book by McIntyre that I've read. The book was a riveting read. I expected to be let down after The Liar's Club, but I enjoyed this book very much. It's not like The Liar's Club, which reads like a novel. In writing about Ursula Burton, the woman who carried the code name Sonia, McIntyre writes a biography which covers her life from birth to death, and what a biography it was. From the time she was a young Jewish girl growing up in Germany, Ursula Burton had been sympathetic to the communist cause. Even though she came from a well-off family, she sympathized with the poor and the downtrodden trodden around her. Communism seemed to hold the solutions to poverty, and a lot of people felt that way back then. She was also addicted to excitement and danger. As a young married woman living in Shanghai with her architect husband, Rudy, she was recruited to become a Soviet spy. She later left Rudy for a succession of lovers, and she had children by three different men. Finally, she married a spy that she had recruited herself, a British man named Lynn Burton. She almost always lived with with her children while carrying out her dangerous assignments, which 
kind of blew my mind. And I was astonished at the complex international Soviet spy networks in operation before, during, and after World War II. I had not understood how invasive, uh, pervasive these spy networks were. Sonia herself was responsible for getting plans for the atomic bomb into Stalin's hands. The book was a real eye-opener for me. She was a complicated and fascinating woman, and the world she lived in is the stuff of thrillers. I'd recommend this book to anyone who's interested in World War II, the Cold War, or spies. Next, for the word capital, I read The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, Creating Currents of Electricity and Hope by William Kamkwamba. I had watched Kamkwamba give a TED Talk after he graduated from Dartmouth College years ago. I thought his story was amazing, so to me, it represented capital in the sense of something at the apex of fabulousness, and the book didn't let me down. Kamkwamba was a boy growing up in Malawi and his family wasn't rich, but they did have a farm. He was a bright boy and he wasn't afraid of hard work, but he also desperately wanted to go to school past primary level where most children went in Malawi at the time he grew up and I think it was in the 1990s. His parents were hardworking people and they did the best they could for their children. It's hard to say what would have come of Kumquamba if he had been able to attend high school the way he wanted to. The year he was to begin his formal schooling, a famine struck Malawi. Way. It would have been bad enough, but the corrupt government squandered the few resources the people had selling surplus food to the highest bidders, often in other countries, leaving the Malawians with nothing. The chapters on the famine were difficult to read. You hear about things like this and believe you can sort of imagine what it must be like, but in my wildest dreams, I never would have thought up the scenes that Kumquamba describes. It was heartbreaking on so many levels, and it left his family much too poor to pay for him to go to even the cheapest, most ill-equipped high school, but Kumquamba didn't give up. He had always been interested in machines and how they work. He went to a local primary school where they had a small library of books written in English. He checked out science books and books about physics, and he took them home and struggled to read and understand them, even though his English was scanty. Slowly, with a lot of experimentation and help from a cousin and a friend, he figured out how to make a windmill that provided electrical power to his family family's home. Until he had powered a few light bulbs, they had always had to go to bed at sunset. There was no light. Now, his plan was to go on to create pumps and an irrigation system so that his family would never have to worry about starving again. When his story was picked up by the media, he became an international sensation. This book is so heartwarming and inspiring. I went back and watched the other films on YouTube that I could find that interviewed Konkwamba and talked about him, and I recommend this book to absolutely everyone. And the last book I read was Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television by Jerry Mander. When I mentioned this in my first video, I discovered that it's a controversial topic. People are not willing to give up television yet. This book was written in 1977, and the word to go with it was display. Jerry Mander began his career in advertising, but quickly became disenchanted with the world of advertising, despite the money and the luxurious lifestyle that he got from it. He does an impressive amount of research in this book to convince the world of the 1970s that television was evil and a destructive force that was best eliminated entirely. It was an audacious attempt that obviously failed. And his idea may sound naive and quaint to us today, and maybe it was, but he does make some good points. It was interesting to me that some of his arguments were based on technology involved with analog television sets. I'm not a very techy person, and I may slaughter his proposition, but basically his argument was television sets at the time produced pictures through raw that made images through dots of varying hues. If you looked at them up close, no picture was discernible. Because of this, the images a television produce enter the brain and embed themselves there without conscious processing, at least televisions back in his day. In this way, they could brainwash the viewer without the viewer even knowing it. He goes into a great deal of detail about how this works, and I'm not sure I understood all of that. Another point he makes is that television is not good at presenting reality as it really is. Because screens are small, you can see beautiful scenery, but rather than being awed by how beautiful it is, you're actually bored by it. For you to stay interested in a small screen like television, the motion needs to be constant and 
light switches need to happen often. So you're actually left with a worse impression of what you're looking at, like a mountain range, for example, than you would be if you saw it in person. And this reminded me of those depressing television commercials for flat screen plasma TVs years ago. I don't know if you remember those, but they had a family that went to the Grand Canyon and they preferred to look at the scenery on the plasma TV rather than at the actual Grand Canyon. And this leads me to another point he makes. Advertisers have an outsized influence on what's selected to be broadcast to begin with. A show may want to cover an important issue like strip mining, for example, but if the show has very few advertisers, it's unlikely to be well produced, leaving many thinking the entire issue is boring and unimportant because it is so boring. When a program like that is followed by, say, a football game with lots of action, crowds, music, and cheerleaders, a viewer who sat through the earlier show is likely to forget all about what it said in the hoopla that follows. And that made sense to me. He also says we ourselves physically are changed. Our brains are changed from the very act of allowing images of television into our brains. This goes beyond brainwashing. Our brains are literally rewired and function differently when we spend hours a day soaking in whatever the medium throws at us. It shapes our future experience of reality in an unreal way. He makes too many other points to cover in a short discussion. If you're curious, I'd recommend you read this book, especially if you grew up in the years when television was a big part of life for everyone. I'll have to confess with all honesty that after age 11, I never enjoyed watching TV. I always, after that age, found it intensely boring, and I'm not sure why, but sometime around sixth grade, I started reading a lot, and I just found daydreaming was a lot more fun. I still don't watch TV a lot. I enjoy an occasional movie, and I confess I'm a YouTube addict. And by the way, Mander didn't have the same problem with movies that he had with television shows. It was the programming and the medium itself that was the problem. But I have to confess, like I said, I am a YouTube addict. I probably watch around two hours of YouTube every day. I'm a for a good documentary, and Mander didn't have a high opinion of documentaries either. It was an enjoyable and eye-opening read overall. I thought some of what he said was true, some of it was plausible, and some of his arguments I thought may have been a bit overblown. I believe TV is hypnotic, but I'm not sure that's always as detrimental as he thought, for example. One other note on this book. It's an excellent example of how a good writer lays out a book. According to Mortimer J. Adler and Charles Van Doren in How to Read a Book, The Classic Guide to Intelligent Reading, in the chapter on understanding an author, Mander laid out everything exactly perfectly. Mander went on to write write several more books on his own and in collaboration with other writers. Of these, I'd like to read Mander's book, The Case Against the Global Economy, and A Turn Toward the Local, next. It was written in 1996. If you've read any of these books, what are your thoughts? Do you agree or disagree with my comments? If so, let me know in the comment box. And until next time, happy reading.